Okay, number four. In a temperate zone, what will typically drive the duct design of the HVAC system? Question, possible answers are cooling system, dehumidification, heating system, sling psychrometer. So first thing we can say is it's not a sling psychrometer. A uh, sling psychrometer is uh, a really kind of fascinating little device. It's worth, uh, it's kind of the old school way of uh, figuring these things out. It's this little device uh, that sits on a little handle um, and you hold the handle and then you swing this thing around uh, above your head. And at the end of it, it has a little uh, sponge in it and you wet the sponge. And uh, after you swing it a few times, you, the thing itself tests the sponge and it can tell whether you have left uh, moisture behind or whether you've gained moisture into the sponge through that process. And it's a way of understanding the sort of latent heat issues, like how much moisture, what's the actual temperature. Uh, it sort of gives you a much fuller picture of what's the, the air like in that space. Um, there's other ways to do it now, but this, any of the old school folks will still use one of these sling spectrometers. That's not the answer, but it's an interesting thing and it's worth uh, noting it. You may show up on the exam somewhere. So the question really is, is it about cooling, is it about dehumidification, or is it about heating? And there's actually a very simple way to think about this. Uh, in a temperate zone, uh, temperate zone is, uh, what that's referring to is, it's the part of the country that gets both uh, seriously cold days and seriously hot days. Like if we were talking about something, say, in Anchorage, we'd probably mostly be just worried about how cold it gets. So we'd be totally focused on the heating system. If we were talking about something in Phoenix, yeah, it gets a, you know, a little cool every once in a while, but we're really mostly worried about the, the cooling system. So the question is, in a temperate zone, how do you choose which one you're designing for? Uh, and the answer is on this, um, when we're talking about an HVAC system for the duct work, uh, we're gonna be designing for a cooling system. And the reason for that is because if you think about how uh, hot the air is coming out of a air handling unit in the heating season, and compare that to the air of the room, uh, you know, let's say we have air coming out at uh, 110 degrees and the heat of the room is, say, uh, 68. So we have a temperature difference of about 42 degrees. This is in the heating, heating system in the winter. In the cooling, let's say our room temperature is, uh, I don't know, say 75. Well, the air temperature that's gonna be blowing through is probably gonna be about 55. Now, it could be lower, it could be a little higher, it's a couple different things, but very quickly you realize, wow, even, you know, that's only a 20 degree difference. So in order to change the volume of air, the, the temperature of a volume of air, say this is a room, uh, if you imagine that room, somebody's standing in there, right? And we're gonna to try to change that, the temperature of that room by say one degree. If I'm blowing in air that has a difference of 42 degrees from the current temperature, it's gonna go much faster than if I'm blowing in air that only has a delta difference of 20 degrees. So if it's gonna be much harder to do with, uh, for cooling than it is for the heating, that means the harder one is gonna rule. And I'm gonna to have to define uh, all my choices through cooling. So the size of the duct is actually gonna be sized uh, for a cooling system and then you just kind of know that the heating system will work because it's, that cooling system is gonna be, the duct is gonna be bigger than what it would actually be needed for the heating system. So it's kind of a funny, you have to kind of think through it in a sort of odd way. Uh, if you're doing both heating and cooling and they're both important, well, how do you, de how do you design the duct work? Uh, it comes down to the fact that the delta, the difference between the kind of lived in the room temperatures uh, and the supplying temperature is so much lower for cooling. I have so much smaller of a difference uh, that I have to really focus on that one to be able to get that one to work. Uh, this other one uh, I can do much more easily because I have a much bigger delta and I can just dump in some air and it'll pretty rapidly change the temperature of a room. 
So then one question is, well, why don't I just make, and so why am I using 55 degree air and not say 35 degree air? Um, and the answer to that is, one, it's a little bit harder to make 35 degree air, it's a little expensive. But the real answer is you start blowing 35 degree air into a room uh, where people are trying to work or, or sleep or something like that, and you'll get complaints immediately. Our bodies just don't like air blowing on us that's that cold. Uh, whereas warm air doesn't bother us in the winter, we don't mind having that get blown on us uh, with that big of a difference. Tina has a good question. She says, in the equation and what we're showing here, is it, are we showing it backwards? Shouldn't the larger difference be the higher volume? Shouldn't 42 degree difference result in a higher volume? Uh, uh, no. Um, I, this is why I say it's a little counterintuitive and it takes a little kind of getting used to. Um, the, if, you, if, you think that the, if you imagine that every cubic foot, so every CFM, cubic foot per minute uh, of air, so here's a little cubic foot of air uh, going about to go into this room. And that cubic foot of air is 42 degrees warmer than this room is. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of these. I've got them all lined up all in a row. They're all these cubic feet of air ready to move along uh, through this process, going through that ductwork, right? And that thing's 42 degrees, that air in that cubic foot is 42 degrees warmer than the air in that room. Well, it's not going to take too many of those cubic feet before I can raise this room temperature by a degree or to five degrees or 10 degrees, whatever it is I'm trying to do. Whereas if I have less d difference, so now imagine we're cooling, and instead of this being 42 degrees different, it's now only 20 degrees different, I have to put in a whole bunch more of these ones that are only 20 degrees different before the temperature inside that space is going to get uh, uh, changed. So uh, the, the temp change in the room is going to depend on uh, the, number, the, the sheer number of cubic feet per minute. Uh, and if the difference in temperature is uh, so close, then obviously I need more cubic feet. Um, if you think about it, like let's say for just a quick sec, imagine that instead of being 55, let's say it was uh, uh, you know, 70 degrees. It was only a five uh, degree difference. Well, clearly if I'm pumping in air that's only five degrees different, it's going to take an awful lot of air uh, before it's going to impact the, the room temperature. Uh, so uh, we're just kind of expanding that a little bit to sort of more usable, usable uh, numbers, something like 55, somewhere in that range. Uh, but because of that, because of you're bringing in the, that CFM, uh, that delta makes a big difference. And so, yeah, the cooling will be... Uh, the bigger amount. And along those same lines, if you, use that, if you use that same example, if the heating were 400 degrees. Right, right. If we had a 400 degree difference in the, in the delta between the, the two temperatures, you know, you could put in a few CFM uh, and it would immediately change the temperature of that room, right? So if you exaggerate it, this is actually a pretty good strategy on the exam. Uh, if you exaggerate the situations, usually they explain themselves pretty fast. Is there a, another question, is there a, like a normal or a natural limit to how cold the system could make the air? You know, like is, can, can a system only make it so cold in a room? Um, th there are each of the different uh, refrigerants and, you know, different types of uh, chillers versus, uh, you know, some other systems. Each of them will have some sort of natural limit. I actually don't really know what it would be because almost nobody ever goes to it uh, in terms of regular architecture. Um, you'd find it obviously in systems that are, you know, for walk-in refrigerators, and you know, there's all kinds of places where the same basic idea is happening. Um, but that's, you know, it's not my world, so I don't really know. But the uh, the gist of it is, yes, you can actually make those sort of pretty standard systems go down um, easily to like 30 in the 30s range, um, and then some, I'm sure, can go down into the teens and and you know, single digits. I don't think you could easily go below that until unless you had very, very specific uh, refrigerant uh, system. But like I said, it's all about human comfort. And human comfort, it's going to be hard to get those uh, temperatures below, say, 50 or something uh, before it really bugs people. Mm -hmm.